With me, it is exceptionally true that the presidency is no bed of roses. James Polk America is a nation that was born in conflict, fought for freedom, and then quickly began to grow. But that's not to say that conflict had dissipated following the Revolutionary War. One such conflict plagued the Constitutional Convention, caused upsets when adding new states to the Union, and eventually drove the nation to a civil war. This hot-button topic, of course, was slavery. The following presidents had to struggle with how to compromise with pro- and anti-slavery forces, as well as continue to expand the growing country's borders westward towards the Pacific Ocean to claim their so-called God-given right, their manifest destiny. These are the stories of William Henry Harrison, John Tyler, James K. Polk, Zachary Taylor, Millard Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, and James Buchanan, told with a little help from the units of the national parks. Let's dive in. The first person we're discussing today actually didn't do that much while he was president, because he didn't get the chance to. William Henry Harrison only served for a month in office before dying to pneumonia, presumably at least partially due to the fact that Harrison gave the longest inaugural speech on record on a cold rainy day at the beginning of March. However, before he was president, he served in the military fighting Native Americans and the British during the War of 1812, particularly going after one Native American chief known as Tecumseh, a campaign that culminated in the Battle of the Thames in 1813, which resulted in Tecumseh's death. Harrison had also fought Tecumseh's brother at the Battle of Tippecanoe two years earlier, which promoted him to national fame, so much so that he used the slogan, Tippecanoe and Tyler II, a reference to the battle and his running mate, when he campaigned for president in the 1840 election. Due to Harrison's death shortly after entering office, John Tyler had to step up in Harrison's place. Many people weren't expecting Tyler to become president when Harrison had been elected, but now they had to contend with the Tyler II part of the 1840 election campaign. Tyler's biggest contribution while in office helped pave the way for one of the biggest historical events of the decade, the annexation of Texas. However, it wouldn't be until the next president, James K. Polk, that the state was admitted into the Union. Texas had become independent from Mexico in 1836, but due to impending pressure from the country they had broken free from, Texas entered into negotiations with the United States and entered the Union in 1845 under the Polk presidency. Mexico was not pleased with this development, as it had never seen Texas as an independent state, and tensions finally reached a boiling point on May 8, 1845, when Polk sent General Zachary Taylor to engage Mexican forces at Palo Alto, the first conflict of the war now preserved as Palo Alto Battlefield National Historical Park. The war went on until Polk was finally able to secure a victory in early 1848. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo confirmed Texas's place in the Union, as well as bringing in the future states of California and New Mexico into the possession of the United States. Many people were anxious to travel westward to explore these new lands acquired under Polk, and several trails were used by settlers to get out there. These trails are preserved today as the Oregon National Historic Trail, California National Historic Trail, and the Santa Fe National Historic Trail. Polk did not run again in 1848, meaning that a prime opportunity opened up for the hero of the Mexican-American War, Zachary Taylor, to take his chance at the high office. Taylor subsequently won the election and went on to become the nation's 12th president. Taylor served for about a year when he consumed a large amount of cherries and iced milk, a dessert similar to ice cream, at a 4th of July party, giving him a stomach ailment that caused him to die just five days later. Taylor doesn't have any national parks named after him, but he does have an interesting state park in his name. Fort Zachary Taylor State Park is located on Key West, Florida, with construction on the fort beginning in 1845, making it one of the southernmost forts in the United States, along with Fort Jefferson at nearby Dry Tortugas National Park. Following Taylor's death, Millard Fillmore took over the presidency and was immediately caught up in a debate over slavery. Remember how the U.S. had gained a lot of land out west after the Mexican-American War? Well, in addition to settlers heading out to make new lives for themselves, gold was found in early 1848 in the lush valleys of California, sparking a mass immigration to the area with plenty of people hoping to strike it rich. By 1850, enough people were populating the territory that discussions began to make the land a state. Of course, figuring out if California would be a slave or free state was brought up, and Fillmore had to step in, supporting a compromise where California would become a free state, but new territories entering the Union in the future could choose whether they wanted to allow slavery or not. This idea of popular sovereignty, or letting the people choose, would eventually lead to even more tension under the 14th president, Franklin Pierce. In 1854, during Pierce's term, an act was introduced that would allow popular sovereignty in the Kansas and Nebraska territories, contradictory to the earlier Missouri Compromise and Compromise of 1850. Pierce backed the act, and after it was passed, some Kansans became furious. Turmoil erupted throughout the Kansas Territory for several years, coming to be known as Bleeding Kansas. One of the prominent figures in the Kansas uprisings was John Brown, who eventually made his way east to attack a place called Harper's Ferry in 1859, attempting to start a slave uprising, but ultimately failing. His efforts are preserved at Harper's Ferry National Historical Park in West Virginia. 
Our final president we discuss today is James Buchanan. Buchanan's term lasted from 1857 until March 4, 1861, when the country was on the brink of war. Only two days into his presidency, a big controversy concerning slavery popped up, and this saw slavery being upheld by the highest court in the nation, the Supreme Court. A slave by the name of Dred Scott had filed for his freedom, and although he had won it in the old courthouse, now a part of Gateway Arch National Park in downtown St. Louis, the Missouri Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court deemed him a slave. Luckily, a close friend of his would set him free shortly after the verdict. Buchanan throughout his term tried to make feeble efforts at compromise that benefited southern states allowing slavery, to no avail. On December 20, 1860, the state of South Carolina broke off from the Union, and with it would unleash the final chain of events that would inflame the nation in civil war. And that's all we have for today. Not every president has a national mark directly tied to them, so we here at REC try to connect some of the historical events going on at the time into these videos as well. Join us next time, however, for a man who most certainly has a lot of national parks associated with him. A man simply known as Honest Abe. Thanks for watching.